he's like oh i get to go to your house <laughs> like, he's like have yeah <laughs> hook up. drink me what does that mean he's <laughs> like absolutely you are so pretty i can't believe you're talking to me I'm Gabe. And I'm Kat. And we're, and we're the Ghouls Next Door. Yes, we are the media literacy show from a horror lens where we explore the real life, historical, uh, psychological, supernatural reasonings behind our cinematic fears. And we are closing out our It Is Written series with the book from Sylvia Moreno Garcia, specifically certain dark things. Yeah, it was really good. I had, I usually don't like vampire books, and I was like, wow, this is like really interesting. I've never vibed with vampires this hard. It was, it was cool. <laughs> yeah, Stressful, I, but really good. I love vampire books and have always read them and enjoyed yes. just that I realm. Them. I love supernatural, whatever, <laughs> anything. <laughs> like cool fairies got it werewolves got it um and i always love like like you know we've talked about true blood we've talked about i mean i watch vampire diaries love it so Mm -hmm. whenever there's like i just really love the different ways people approach the lore and like how Mm -hmm. vampires came to be the different ways that they're like affected by the sun do these vamp are these vampires like the vampires we learn about or are these Mm -hmm. vampires different or um you know, when they're like, oh, they're the mark of Cain is vampirism. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you put the yeah. Bible. <laughs> like, yeah. I get like so excited when they explain like even how you make a vampire or um, how they, you know, whatever. All the different reasons. I think it's like so exciting because it's like the one thread is like it's a vampire. We kind of have the, the gist. It's like you yeah, drink mm-hmm. blood. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you're not like you don't age the way humans do. Like they're there are certain things that are always there, but the way that different people kind of approach what they are and taking the time to kind of describe that um, yeah. is really exciting. And this book, I was just like, what? <laughs> and they so like, many different kinds of vampires and they all just have like this very rich history that we don't even get like all of. And it's just like, it was actually like very interesting in a way that like, I wish there was more than one even like a little bit just to like unpack the world more it was really like I'd never mm-hmm. heard of vampires in this way and it was very interesting yeah this is another one where I think it would be really beneficial to have a show mm. like you know where we can really like hang out like it, it, you could have all these different vampires all this different lore like their motivations get time with them and kind of expand on the world because it's very like we're getting like these characters we're talking about them um but there's so much that's like implied because of their yeah Mm -hmm. you get like a glimpse and you're like this could be whole entire thing whole book could just be this and everyone (laughs) would be like whoa but i loved the perspective it did take on too because the characters were like really endearing and wonderful Mm -hmm. and i love that yeah And and then like even the ones that you hate it's like thank you like for explaining yeah that's real <laughs> <laughs> like everyone is so well explained and in you know like we said last week with Sylvia Moreno Garcia is like each one of her books is so unique like she creates this entire world for each one and they there's you know the certain things that are always there like this mm-hmm. you know understanding and appreciation of Mexico as like not as it relates to other places, but just as it is for itself. Um, mm-hmm. Having like that history and a you know understanding of it, and putting you know uh, highlighting both like the beauty and like the the bad about Mexico as well. Like it's always really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I just like <laughs> she puts like Mexican gods in here. I'm like yes, 
tell me more. Um, yeah. And it always just makes you want to learn more. So that's why I think this this episode is really great because you get like we get to see like you know the the world that she built, the different characters and creations. But then we'll also talk about colonization in Mexico in your section. So it's like <laughs> it's a little bit mm-hmm. everything. A little bit of everything. It was also cool. I remember, like, after learning about her, like, the little, met, like, call-outs of Baja, California. I was like, oh, that's where she lived. And I was like, <laughs> you, know, you just have, like, the context. And I was like, that's so cool that she, like, incorporated that. Like, of course, it makes sense because, you know, you're right about what you know. But it was, like, really yeah. interesting uh, to have that, like, perspective of our last episode being like, oh, yeah, I actually know a little bit about her life. And that actually shows up in the book, like, a handful of times. And I got all excited. Yeah, yeah, it definitely, like, knowing about her influences it, and yeah, like I said last week, it's just, like, I love the excuse to learn more, because it's just, I mean, we're gonna find out in your section, too, just how little we're taught about these subjects, and so Mm -hmm. uh, being in America, right, and we just don't have enough stories that are like this, where um, we can explore that world from this very specific lens of like appreciation and understanding that's so like deep (laughs) Mm -hmm. like in relation to like how people usually do it so Mm -hmm. yeah not eurocentric it's just like yeah (laughs) other places exist and they're also very interesting and great Um, yeah um awesome well why don't i i dive in why don't why don't i do my um, as I said, we're talking about Certain Dark Things, which was first published in 2016, so not too long ago, but so thankful that it exists. And it is a pulse-pounding neo-noir that reimagines vampire lore. And it's about, uh, welcome to Mexico City, an oasis in a sea of vampires. Domingo, a lonely garbage-collecting street kid, is just trying to survive its heavily policed streets when a jaded vampire on the run swoops into his life. Adol, the descendant of Aztec blood drinkers, is smart beautiful and dangerous domingo is mesmerized um and it was written by sylvia moreno garcia Duh. <laughs> um like i said before like uh my favorite book of hers is gods of jade and shadow certain dark things like but every single one i'm like i can't really compare any of them because <laughs> mm-hmm. they're all so unique um but this is like i really did enjoy and love um this book for for it being so unique and I was again I'm jealous of any young person who gets to read this instead of Twilight (laughs) yeah (laughs) so real um like you will benefit from like a more true vision of what love and loving a vampire would be too like yeah characters with like personalities and like like stories that like make you interested in who they are as people (laughs) yeah and it's not just like like, shells and the predator yeah yeah right (laughs) you left me in a predator kill yourself if we're not in love you know like that's not Uh how that works um (laughs) and this is all like this is what real world is like um Mm -hmm. so in certain dark things which is named for the line in a pablo neruda poem uh i love you as certain dark things are loved love that line uh we get a glimpse of mexico city uh that is honest and complicated full of death that we often reserve for cities like new york or la and maybe even paris and london writer amal el motar which i mentioned in last week's episode said of this mexico one of sylvia moreno garcia's great achievements in certain dark things is her representation of mexico city as a real place a city with history districts subways with beauty and ugliness with problems um and also in the that article mentions like that kind of seeing it from not its proximity to america right uh but its proximity to south america right like um yeah. and kind of highlighting the the glory of that and so in this very real neo-noir alternate universe mexico city there are vampires uh and these vampires are born not made um which i was like what like as soon as that's like because <laughs> there's like a point where someone's about to get drunk by a vampire and he's like am i gonna get changed like what's going on yeah, do like, i get no. to be <laughs> she's like no we are born um yeah. which changes like it, it absolutely changes like what they are <laughs> from yeah. like this predator like monster to like just another race right mm-hmm. like 
Uh, um, and they differ drastically, greatly impacted by their place of origin, which I was like, that I was like, this is it. <laughs> this, is like, this is the best vampire book I've ever read. <laughs> um, the story follows a few colorful characters, both vampires and humans. So we have Atoll, who's a Mexican vampire, whose species are bird-like, inspired by Aztec gods, of which they are named after. Um, mm-hmm. Hers is like the god of water moving mm-hmm. water or something like that at Taloa. Um, and like her sister's name, like, and I wouldn't, they kind of described her as being bird. Like I was like, that is so cool. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and like one thing about the way that she envisions like this blend of like culture and the supernatural is like, I'm currently working on a script where I'm trying to do that. And so I was like seeing this, I was like, oh, look at what you can do. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, there's also Domingo, who is a young street boy who gets uh, by sifting through trash and becomes a can- companion for Adol. Um, There's Anna uh, Aguirre, who is a detective skilled at hunting vampires but tired of doing it and has sought refuge in the vampire-free Mexico City. Mac- uh, Nick is the son of the leader of the Necros, which is a villainous race of colonizer vampires, not subtle at all. And he is hunting <laughs> Adol. <laughs> Like, flat out is like they're the colonizer vampires let me tell you how awful they are i was like girl yeah. <laughs> nick is you. the worst <laughs> these necros are disgusting and i was like aren't they yeah. um nick's family's renfield which is the human familiar um and they are named after the character in dracula renfield who mm. like, helps dracula um and rodrigo is sent on this mission to find atoll and bring her back alive to nick's father mr godoy and then there's bernardino who is a vampire from the revenant species they're like a nosferatu hunchbacked race that can give and take life from anyone even other vampires that was so, cool. so fascinating I want to. I want to just know more about revenants too, just because it was crazy. Yeah, I want to like. Yeah, I want to see every one of these, and there has to be more because, like, later I'm going to talk about like the fact that um, uh, Atul can be in the sun a little bit, and yeah. it's more or less because she has like some melanin in her. So I was like, what about? black vampires like what about like african vampires and then mix up with their gods and lord like i was like there's so much more that we could be <laughs> going mm-hmm. through like um it just opens up the world for possibility based on like where you are geographically and like your culture and your history and like oh, oh, yeah and I, um, I agree it would be totally great on screen like i feel like a lot of the stuff you'd be like wow that witnessing the giving of life and death uh and a lot of the fight scenes would just be bonkers but really cool yeah it's very and it's also like the neon noir as like aesthetic is so fun and people really love that like to get that like grimy like mexico city that's like you know neon lights everywhere and oh so cool um (laughs) if we could have uh oh my gosh what is that show altered carbon you know, mm. like we could have a certain dark things. Yeah. We can make it. Happen. I mean, who knows? Maybe it'll get there. We'll see. Yeah. Let's Time make all her, people make all her things. Um, yeah. In certain dark things, Atoll is on the run after committing a horrible offense, murdering a vampire's wife and others. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoilers. <What>? Uh, <laughs> you should know. This show's full of spoilers. Uh, Her own family has been savagely murdered. Their powerful reign in Mexico wiped out quickly. And Atul is from the, I'm going to, I'm so sorry. I'm going to try very hard to say this Mexican word. Uh, Talawapulchi. Talawapulchi. A uh, species of vampires, which is inspired by Aztec gods. And she mm-hmm. has stopped in the vampire free Mexico City to connect with an old family friend of her mother's, Elisa, so that she can get papers to travel further south and into safety presumably safety um she is being pursued by rodrigo and nick of the necros clan and atul encounters the young and sweet domingo on the subway invites him to her home where she asks uh later asks him if she can drink him Mm -hmm. which you know happens he's like oh i get to go to your house (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) (laughs) drink me what does that mean he's like absolutely you are so pretty i can't believe you're talking to me yeah (laughs) i love domingo such a sweet boy oh my god i was like that's i if i had read this book before i got my cat o'malley he would have been Mm. named domingo 
Um, <laughs> meanwhile, in Mexico City, there are human gangs who'd like to keep Mexico City vampire free. One gang in particular, the Deep Crimson, hires skilled vampire huntress detective Anna to find and kill both Atul and Nick. Uh, and what follows is a deadly chase, emotional explorations, and a study in Mexican colonization history, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, Sylvia Monerita Garcia is so talented at doing. Um, mm -hmm. Each of these characters, as we've been saying this whole time, is so profoundly written with depth and honest motivations. And my heart ached for, like, specifically the simple and sweet boy Domingo, like... <laughs> so sweet and he falls in love with Adol because who wouldn't uh mm -hmm. and through his limited lens of the world attempts to protect her like it's just like she's a vampire she is so much more powerful than him she can destroy him and like completely ruin him and he's caught up in her world that's so dangerous and the entire time he is always innocent and just like pure like he's just like there's good and there's bad and I want you to say help mm -hmm. <laughs> we're like um and it would be so easy to rate him as like just a lovesick pup who quickly disrobes himself of his morals to best serve atoll like that's generally what we see a lot with like vampire romance is like mm -hmm. you kind of turn a human a little evil or not evil but yeah, like, or you like lose yourself like you don't you're not a you're not you anymore you are yeah like, you have to yeah. like turn off certain parts of yourself to be able to like still see them as lovable and mm -hmm. worthy of love because they're gonna commit terrible acts so yeah. a lot of the times you have to be like like I, oh they do all these wonderful things like and they murdered all those people and i just really, you know like <laughs> yeah. just kind of like struggle that off i was like oh but they bring me tea when my stomach hurts like you know yeah. and then she <laughs> ate that guy you know it's, yeah. it's hard it's hard vampire diaries looking yeah. at you um but what i really loved about domingo is that he stays true to his integrity and care um like a lot of characters are like you're gonna lose that they're like this is gonna happen to you and he never does he he mm -hmm. stays true to himself and his morals the entire time um and his understanding of the world is through the lens of film books and pieces of the world that he picks up along the way in subway carts and in the trash that he sorts through um Atul like you know kind of teases him a bit about the fact that mm -hmm. he's always comparing like their their adventures or what's going on to Dracula or um you know, Night of the Living Dead or something like all these things that he has just consumed because that's his whole life. It's just like mm -hmm. reading and getting these minor escapes so that he can keep just surviving um, through like a very dark and like sad world. Like it's not mm -hmm. very hope inspiring <laughs> where he lives and what he does. Um, but he again is still sweet despite all yeah. that. Like it hasn't turned him. Like he even like his like he explains in one story that like his girlfriend left him for like this like gang leader and he's just like but I understand why she did that like he's not even hard up on her like he's like <laughs> he's yeah. like I understand why she picked him I tried but you know good he for her he just has like Don't a good heart mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's a good um, heart simply pure honestly um and Sylvia Moreno Garcia allows us to see each character individually giving us intimate moments with them to learn of their motivations and decisions leading to the events of the book uh, so that everyone's kind of it's pretty much fully fleshed out. So you know what they're mm -hmm. doing here, but you know like how they got here and why they would react the way that they do. Um, mm -hmm. And it's easy to feel for them except for Nick because <laughs> for Nick. Nick is awful. <laughs> except for Nick. Um, and probably his dad <laughs> we don't yeah. really get to see Mr. Roy, but f him too uh detective anna though a skilled vampire hunter is also simply a single mother who yearns to protect her daughter like it's not like simply a single but like that's a big deal um but i mean like that's her core that's like her motivation for everything and it's to give her daughter a life that she never had and to escape poverty and just like survive <laughs> yeah. so you're like i ain't even mad at you um yeah no that's real yeah, and even uh, Rodrigo, who's found himself in the snare of Mr. Godoy, is somewhat forgivable and understandable. Like, you kind of see, like, he doesn't want to be doing this, but you get yeah. caught up and you're stuck now. And you don't mm -hmm. have, like, like, you are just a person, and they are a supernatural force that could just undo you. Mm -hmm. for, and they will. Like, 
Oh, poor guy. So <laughs> one of my favorite pieces of Moreno Garcia's alternate world are the different races of the vampires, as we mentioned, and they are inspired by their or origin locations and were very exciting and inventive. Everything about the vampire races is different from the way they consume blood or if they do at all, their effect on humans and their physical appearance. Adults people are akin to gods. It is such a refreshing imagining of vampires. These ones are bird-like with sharp features, wings, an affinity for sugar, and a proboscis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> spoilers. Um, and I was like, what? Uh, yeah. Atul cannot eat human food or she'll be sick, but she's graced with melanin so she can venture into the sun, though it will make her tired and eventually take a toll on her well-being. But I was like, that's dope. <laughs> like mm -hmm. a good explanation of like, of course. Of course they can go in the sun. That doesn't make any sense that they wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. um, then you have the Necros, which are a sickly, disgusting race of vampires that are literally the colonizers of Mexico. They are a walking STD. <laughs> it's like, it's so funny. Having sex um, or uh, exchanging of any fluids with a Necros spells death for humans and even some vampires. Uh, necros are pale and beautiful. They lure their prey in and by feeding their victim their blood, they can control their actions and hear their thoughts. Uh, they mm -hmm. burn up in the sun, not like traditional vampires into pillars of ash, but they get boils and burns, um, which is a major downer for these very vain vamps. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> my precious face. My beautiful face. Uh, ew. <laughs> when she was like, <laughs> having sex with them, you will die. And I was like, she made the colonizers an STD. Like, she just yeah. flat out was like, they are gross. Yeah. <laughs> no, like, they are bad. They are bad for everyone. And I was like, wow. Yeah, you're right. Um, then there's the Revenants, which we see in Bernardino, uh, who are an older species of vampires. And they have telltale hunchbacks and thin, translucent skin. And Revenants don't simply drink blood, but consume life energy. They can shave off years of your life or give you more. Um, mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, they can drink from humans and vampires. And Bernardino is like something to be feared, but also like a sympathetic character. Because he's yeah. been, and also, like, I love he was like obsessed with cats, and like, yeah, <laughs> there's so much about it. I was like, I love this man, like, this old, he's very most yeah. <laughs> like, like, oh, sorry. whatever. Um, he was great, <laughs> and every single one is like, so, like, every time they introduce another one, it's like, there, I'm, there's more though, like, because this mm -hmm. is just what's in, in the vampire free Mexico City. Where, yeah like, what are the vampire filled places like yeah what are they like um one of the other themes in the novel is actually of war um and for atul and nick their families are at odds in a drug war specifically and because it takes place in mexico city makes a lot of sense um atul's family had run the drug trade well for generations in mexico supplying goods to both humans and vampires and nick's family seeking to grab hold of the market murders atul's mother um in retaliation atul murders mr godoy's wife and others and then in further retaliation atul's family is wiped out leaving her on the run <laughs> which is what is happening in this book, right? Um, but there's another war afoot as well, that of humans versus vampires. And in Mexico City, Deep Crimson runs the drug trade and they won't tolerate vampire drug lords on their turf. So they want to mm -hmm. get rid of both of them. Um, and as we saw in Tigers Are Not Afraid, the drug wars and dangers of Mexico City can be easily transformed into mythical beasts. The horrors feeling so monumentally insurmountable. Um, mm -hmm. They essentially become a creature all on their own um, because the people like both vampires and humans are afraid of these yeah. monsters <laughs> like that are, are separate from the fact that like vampires are monsters. It's like, no, but these are like the drug Lord vampires. <laughs> so mm -hmm. they're worse. Like they revenants just hanging out. He'd been here this whole time, not doing nothing, just collecting cats. Right. Yeah. But then as soon as the necros and uh, I'm not going to say the word, <laughs> It's very long. At those people come in. Now it's a problem. Now mm -hmm. you're gonna bring in other monsters. And then the deep crimson are also monstrous. Like they're just people, yeah. but they were also a villain. So essentially, there is 
honestly too much to love and appreciate about dark uh, certain dark things. And as always with a Moreno Garcia novel, I am both entertained and educated. I absolutely love fantastical works that highlight the real world and to have these monsters with motivations, not just for monsters sake, like not just to have a vampire in the story. <laughs> Like, mm-hmm. it's like vampires are bad like but for why um yeah. i wish more vampire werewolf supernatural lore was like this with a world robust in history and influence that was more strategic and less western <laughs> in yeah. its um certain dark things made vampires believable to me understood geographically and racially um like we saw with like fifth season where i was like i know we can't be earthbenders i know that but I also think we could. Yeah, <laughs> because like this seems legit. <laughs> that like if we if they did, if Earth Avengers did exist, this is what they would look like, right? And if yeah. vampires did exist, this is what they would look like. Like yeah. that just makes sense to me. And <laughs> so I'm like, we need more of that. So again, with Moreno Garcia, you never know what exactly to expect, but you do know you'll enjoy the ride. And this tale, like all her others, will be rich in storytelling character explorations and the lands that they inhabit yeah it was super interesting and i just just so many moments where like the character development was just for such like a not super long book it achieves so much like even just like kind of how when we read that one book with a uh, girl with all the guests we didn't read it but we watched the movie or it's just mm-hmm. like even just like a line can give characters so much depth and there were like minutes of that where it was like we are our hunger and then having them, you know, Mm -hmm. still like rise to, you know, just have like moments where you're like, wow. Okay. So like these characters are depth filled. Like they have unique motivations that like, even by the end of the book, you don't even fully get, but you respect and you're like, I wish there was more. And then you're just sitting there like, dang, there ain't though. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I feel like it was a good introduction and as fa- action paced and like fast paced as it was, like it would have mm-hmm. been a really even a fun action movie. Um, but yeah. I feel like if it's in, the, it's one of those cases where I get a glimpse into the world and I'm like, where's the rest of it? <laughs> where's the yeah. rest of the world? And I mean, it's also like uh, a kudos to Sylvia Marina Garcia because like she wrote this one book like as a one off. It's not like a series, right? Like there's not other mm-hmm. ones to our knowledge, yeah, at least not yet. Um, I know it was like published somewhat recently. So, I mean, who knows, maybe they'll get back into it. Um, But yeah, like it's just the writing style that really just kind of gets you enthralled in everything that's happening. I'm really excited to read more of their stuff. Um, I know we're going to read uh, Mexican Gothic, but I am excited to like read other things because she has a really interesting style. Yeah, and we're like, yeah, we're gonna cover Mexican Gothic in October when we discover Gothic horror because that's gonna be really mm-hmm. fun. Such a good topic for for horror, uh, October. Um, but yeah, I, like I said, everyone is so unique, and this one was just like really fun. It's really quick too, so go read it. Like, just go read it, um, yeah. <laughs> and then like pop back in here, and watch this. Um, but yeah, it's super quick, very entertaining. You're gonna care about these characters, and then they're gone, and you're sad because the book is done, <laughs> and you're like, but what else, Sylvia? Yeah. Well, what else? the bright side is. She's 41, so lots more time to be writing a bunch of books. So who knows? Yeah. Maybe we'll get a follow-up some point down the line. Or maybe mm-hmm. there'll just be more vampire times because she just has a really awesome perspective on vampires. Like, who knows? Maybe we'll get that one that you just said, like where it's like other cultures even coming in, like the melanin part coming in and like mm-hmm. really expanding on that. Yeah. And maybe more uh, cats and revenants and super interesting. <laughs> I really yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, and even if there was, like, a, a show where mm-hmm. you expand on that and you have, like, a team of writers, because then it's it's not just Sylvia, so that you could get that point of view of these different cultures, and it could be an honest point of view because it's from those people, right? <laughs> like, yeah, you can have writers are yeah. of, like, diverse, like, writers talking and, like, creating these vampires, like, together would be so cool. Um, and, I mean, considering her vibe, that's, like, very possible, I think. Like, her whole thing was, like, creating spaces for other people to, like, get their stories out. So I could totally see that in the future. I mean, hopefully. Uh, mm-hmm. Hopefully they get into show writing. Because if, like, they can do this in such a short book, my God. 
Yeah. Imagine what like her and like writing on a show and then like NK comes in to like contribute and make her own race of vampire. I'd be like, it's broken. You broke the world. You broke me. Yeah. My brain. Um, or just like funny. there's so many like Afrofuturist writers or like fantasy and fiction writers out there who are making stories like that. Like I've read stories where, you know, the because of the damage we've done to the environment, the sun is too harsh and people can't go outside except black people can go outside. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> like those, are, like I've read these stories. Yeah. And so, um, you know, they're out there. Those writers are out there. So it's just, you know, highlighting them. So I thank yeah, you, uh, Sylvia, for making this book because I, I hope it inspires others to really kind of think outside the box and stop being um, content with just like this very basic <laughs> understanding of vampires and i think it's it's a good time uh to do that and blend like culture and history and also Mm -hmm. inspire people to learn the way that we've learned (laughs) um for sure yeah open their minds get whole new worlds write everything never stop writing all the books and then we'll read them and it'll be great Sylvia Moreno Garcia's Certain Dark Things was a really unique and powerful story of Adel, the descendant of Aztec blood drinkers, living in modern day Mexico City where vampires are not allowed. The story is impactful and very interesting, and it painted a picture of Mexico that I hadn't seen before. I really look forward to reading other books by Sylvia Moreno Garcia to kind of add to this picture, and honestly, I recommend you do the same. In the book, we're given the history and world building that I unfortunately didn't have much context for. I learned a little bit about the Aztecs and a little bit about the impacts of Spanish colonization in school, but not enough. Um, So I really appreciated this book for giving me the opportunity and also a jumping off point to learn something. Um, In my section, I'll be giving you some of that information that I learned about. And honestly, I highly encourage you to learn as well. Um, cause in learning about both these topics, I realized just how little I knew before, um, and just how like watered down and like a sprinkle of the full story, the information I had received in my younger schooling days, um, was compared to the, how to say, I probably don't even still know the whole story, but like compared to like what I was able to find out, um, I just really didn't have this information. So as always, the lesson here is to question what you're taught and ask what is missing, whose perspectives are not present, and why. Uh, Another piece of this I'm realizing and taking in all this information is a week is even two weeks. It's not enough time. (laughs) I think I could research this honestly for my entire life and still not know all the information. Um, One, because I'm not indigenous to this land, so there will always be nuances and information that I'm missing. And two, because the unfortunate result of colonization is the erasure of knowledge, people, and history. I say all this to recognize essentially that I'm not an expert on this subject, so I'm going to do my best to cover it thoughtfully, but I really encourage you to take this information as a jumping off point for your own learning, as well as just to seek out other voices that are not mine, uh, seek out Indigenous voices when learning about these topics. Uh, I am not an expert on this. I've, <laughs> I do not have all the information, but what I did learn was really interesting and hopefully it will inspire you to learn more as well. And honestly, we'll just uh, keep doing it. You know, it's kind of what we've been doing at the ghouls. So uh, <laughs> with that being said, I'll get into it a bit more. Uh, in this book, Certain Dark Things, we're given the window into Adel's world, as well as the world of vampires. Uh, the vampires that Sylvia Moreno Garcia created and what they're kind of based in. So the story follows Adel and a human named Domingo. Uh, Throughout, we're given glimpses of other vampires, as well as their unique quirks, the ways in which they fit into the world, um, and like kind of like the general lore of the story. Uh, There is one vampire specifically uh, that is a colonizer vampire, a necros vampire named Nick, whose existence in many ways is that of a plague to the other vampire species specifically the indigenous vampires, especially. Uh, And this character exists because of the history of Mexico and the impact of colonization and the fact that like the deep impact of colonization is something we have touched on a little bit. Honestly, it's just all the isms that we end up talking about on our show. We've talked about them a handful of times, but something that was really unique about 
certain dark things that I really appreciated was that Nick at no point is rationalized or sympathized with. He is an entire monster who shows no respect for the people of Mexico and instead feels entitled to them and everything around him. At no point are we given a softened version of Nick or a reason to care for him because for real, there aren't any. <laughs> In another story, he may have been our protagonist, too. But thankfully, in certain dark things, he's not. Instead, we're given the perspective of Adol. And a lot of their character development is super interesting because it kind of ties back to this history of Mexico as well as the fall of the Aztecs. So I'm going to speak a little bit to the colonialism of Mexico. Obviously, I am not an expert on this. I learned about this very recently. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of the rundown. So Mexico is colonized by Spain on August 13th, 1521, when Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés took the Aztec capital to Nautitlán. Uh, and in an article in the British Museum called An Indigenous Reframing of the Fall of the Aztec Empire, written by Lara Osario Sonax, head of the Santo Domingo, or Domingo, head of the Santo Domingo Center of Excellence for Latin American Research, and Maria Mercedes Martinez Melanchi, project coordinator for the Santo Domingo Center of Excellence for Latin American Research. They say, for many, this date commemorates the beginning of a period of indigenous genocide, ruthless colonialism, forced religious conversion, and the erasure of indigenous knowledge and practices. In 2021, uh, they started a project that will facilitate research led by indigenous archeologists and heritage specialists to bring indigenous perspectives to this history. Um, it will showcase their new interpretations of pictorial manuscripts and glyphs in the collection using contemporary indigenous knowledge and languages. So essentially I started with this because projects like this will hopefully bring new and more accurate perspective to the events as a lot of the history that is perpetuated is either inaccurate or colonizer led. Uh, in fact, there are so many different versions of this history of this event that I found conflicting information all on the internet, across the internet. Uh, it really just depended on where I was looking. So there are many versions of this story, some that through logic seem more <laughs> accurate than others, and some that I honestly remember learning about in school and being like, that seems sus. You know, like that seems weird. I don't think that that's what happened. Um, but that was what was taught to me in like elementary school. So I'll get into that. Uh, but the siege is said to have lasted 75 days. Uh, that there, it was suggested that there was a war and that conquest was not done just by Spain. Um, as I said, it lasted 75 days and is described as a brutal siege of warships and cannons. There are a few versions of the story of Spanish colonization, many positioning Spain as this godly force, minimizing the power of the indigenous populations that live there and suggesting that a small Spanish army was more powerful than a much larger Mesoamerican empire. Another very interesting piece of this that was just like, I didn't originally plan to talk about at all, but I had found like in my research and I was like, that's bonkers. Um, apparently Hernan Cortez was not supposed to attempt to conquer anybody. He was just supposed to go to like, look, like look around, go like see some stuff. And he was just like in one of his days, he was just like, you know what? I think I'm going to, I'm thinking I'm going to conquer this place. It just seems like the right thing to do. He just felt inspired. <laughs> But he wasn't supposed to do that. So apparently at one point, possibly, uh, he was considered a traitor of Spain. Uh, and another conquistador, Panfilo Narvaez, uh, tried to like fight him and get him to stop, like made an army against him saying he was a traitor to Spain. So uh, it was just really interesting. I was just like, wow, this, this entire thing could have just not happened if this man was just like, I'm going to do the original thing I was supposed to be doing. Um <laughs> So in many ways, uh, it did make it seem like that wasn't even the original plan. Um, but I, I digress. Uh, in an NPR article titled 500 Years Later, the Spanish conquest of Mexico is still being debated by James Frederick. They speak to the many inconsistencies in the portrayal of the Spanish invasion. Um, in fact, the version he initially speaks on is the one of the versions I remember learning about in school. Uh, and it kind of goes like this. I remember learning first that the Aztec Empire, Montezuma, surrendered his empire to Hernan Cortez, and that Cortez claimed Montezuma immediately recognized the divine right of the Spanish and the Catholic Church to rule the lands, and he surrendered his empire. 
as history is written by the victors, it's pretty obvious <laughs> that that story makes no sense um, and is very skewed towards Spain. Uh, one of the alternate versions of the happenings surrounding the Spanish invasion is also pretty skewed towards Spain. Um, and the article speaks to that a bit, that the story completely ignores or minimizes the strength of both the Aztec army as well as the indigenous rivals of the Aztec that fought with Spain. They say... The story of Spanish conquest, as it has been commonly understood for 500 years, goes like this. Montezuma su surrendered his empire to Cortes. Cortes and his men entered Tenochtitlan. They lived there peacefully for months until rebellious Aztecs attacked them. Montezuma was killed by friendly fire, and their surviving conquistadors escaped the city and later returned with Spanish reinforcements. They bravely laid siege to the Tenochtitlan for months and finally captured it on August 13th, 1521, with the Spanish taking their rightful place as leaders of the land we now know as Mexico. Conquest accomplished. What is so ridiculous about this version of events is there are just two very fundamental questions that are missing for me. And I am not the first person to ask these questions. There are this is why there's articles about it. There are historians and scholars who have dedicated their entire lives to answering these questions, as well as native populations who already know what happened. But ultimately, that version of the story that has been perpetuated for 500 years, the people asking questions have been silenced systematically over time. Otherwise, it would not have been perpetuated in this fashion for as long as it has. And there's a reason that that specific version of events is being maintained, has been maintained, et cetera, because it benefits someone. So our media literacy glasses on, thinking about it critically, you're like, there's a reason it was written this way. Um, but the two big questions that really stand out to me is first, when they say they live there peacefully for months until rebellious Aztecs attack them. Why, if we're living peacefully for months, what has happened? What has taken place to motivate a sudden change in mood? Like everyone was chill and then out of nowhere <laughs> we're fighting. I don't like what, what did Cortez or the other conquistadors do? They had to have done something. Someone was messing with things. Someone desecrated a temple or something. You don't just change it up like out of nowhere for no reason. Second question, Cortez had a small army, minuscule, not big enough to take down an entire empire, <laughs> even with Spanish reinforcements. The Aztec empire was gigantic. In fact, there were people in Cortez's army that described the journey from Tenochtitlan back to Spain as going from heaven to hell. Conquistador Bernal Diaz de Quis del Castillo described it as all so wonderful that I do not know how to describe this first glimpse of things never heard of seen or dreamed of before. Spain did not have the force necessary to take out an empire of things Spain had never heard of, seen or dreamed of before. Someone helped them do it. Who helped them do it and why aren't they being included in this story? So uh, some information that I was able to dig up on that is Cortes formed an alliance with the Class Calan Empire who considered the Aztec empire their oppressors. The Spanish presented an opportunity for them to find liberation, so they allied with them in order to take Tenochtitlan, and in exchange, they were able to hold status and safety under Spanish rule until Mexico gained independence from Spain in, uh, I believe, like 1820. There were other indigenous populations that also worked with Spain to take down the Aztecs because of feeling oppressed by them. There were, there were obvious people who were not happy with the Aztec rule, um, who were not just the Spanish. Um, and in an article titled, Don't Call Us Traitors, Descendants of Cortez's Allies, Defend Role in Toppling Aztec Empire, written by David, Ag David Agrin, they quote archaeologists of the Texcalan, specifically archaeologist Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, who says it wasn't 600 to 800 Spaniards who conquered Tenochtitlan. It was thousands and thousands of class Kalans, Wehutsingas, and other peoples who were under the Mex Mexico yoke and wanted to liberate themselves. Um, another archaeologist named Aurel Lopez Corral said Cortez had 30,000 to 40,000 Mesoamericans fighting with him. He couldn't have done it on his own. 
The combination of the Aztec rivals, smallpox, infection, and betrayal all combined to take the city of Tenochtitlan in this battle, the series of battles over a period of time. So, other than the obvious conspiring against them, what else motivated the Aztecs to attack Hernan Cortez after they presumed months of peace? So, it's like to answer the another question like, what did he do? I read many letters that Hernan Cortes wrote, and while I think many of them were likely embellished or filled with outright lies on the actual, ha actual happenings that took place during this time, um, there are some things that did seem possible, specifically like him talking about what he was doing, because it just, he really just did not have any respect for the Aztecs. And it was very obvious in what he was writing, um, specifically his disrespect to their beliefs and customs. So in what is described as Cortez's second letter, uh, he speaks on desecrating a temple, like proudly. He's like, this is the best thing I ever did. Um, desecrating a temple and replacing an idol with an image of Our Lady and the saints. Um, he writes, in these chapels are the images of idols, although, as I have said before, many of them are also found on the outside, the principal ones in which the people have greatest faith and confidence. I precipitated from their pedestals and I cast them down the steps of the temple, purifying the chapels in which they had stood, as they were all polluted with human blood, shed the sacrifices, shed in the sacrifices. In the place of these, I put images of Our Lady and the saints, which excited not a little feeling of Moctezuma and his inhabitants, who at first remonstrated, which means protest. I had to Google what some of these words mean. Um, declaring that if my proceedings were known throughout the country, the people would rise against me, for they believed that their idols bestowed on them a temporal good. And if they permitted them to be ill-treated, they would be angry and withhold their gifts. And by this means, the people would be deprived of the fruits of the earth and perish with famine. In a statement of complete audacity, he told them that their gods weren't real um, and that, like, it really wasn't a big deal um, and that, like, he was doing them a favor and that the one true God is the Catholic God. Um, and reasonably, <laughs> the receivers of this information from him, uh, the Aztec people who were listening to him to say this after desecrating their temple, um, stated outright that him doing this people were not going to like that. Like they were going to rise up against him. And ultimately they did. Um, I'm not certain on the exact order of operations and how this took place and whether his alliance started with the class clans before he entered Tenochtitlan uh, or if the alliance started as a result of the retaliation of the Aztecs after he desecrated the temple um, and in his like conspiring and attempts to conquer Mexico. Uh, it seems overall that the history here is debated. Uh, there's sometimes where it's completely just outright not mentioned um, or that it's just downplayed. So that all seems kind of intentional. Um, what is apparent, however, is the intentional picture that was painted of the indigenous empires, both the Aztecs and their rivals that attempted to validate the violence against them. The MPR article I mentioned previously unpacks this a bit. They say, for centuries, Spanish testimony portrayed the Aztecs and other indigenous groups in the America as uncivilized, savage barbarians. But continued excavation of the great temple in Tenochtitlan has helped change that perception. Specifically, who said this is Raul Barrera Rodriguez, and they are the director of the Urban Archaeology Program at Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History. And they speak to this like misconception in their research and finding... Uh, like temples underneath the city of Mexico City. So Tenochtitlan is a huge city, says Barrera. Um, it had public institutions, a whole system of government, public servants, schools, public services, and it was a totally organized city. When Tenochtitlan fell, the Spanish built their city directly on top of it. The temples and other sacred spaces still exist underneath. And according to another historian, Matthew Restall, author of the book When Montezuma Met Cortez, the image we have 
of the Aztecs is overwhelmingly invented by Spaniards at the time. Uh, they used it not only to justify the conquest and colonization, but any and all acts of violence and su that subsequently emerged. These misunderstandings and perceptions of the Aztecs and other indigenous groups were formed mostly for a Spanish benefit, to validate their conquests and to rationalize the years that followed the fall of Tenochtitlan, in which genocide, <laughs> um, awful things. They, literally moved from the where they were up and we all know what happened in the United States. Uh, it all kind of spread from this idea that they were lesser in some way. Um, the perpetuation of these viewpoints has far reaching implications and all connects with the ways in which Western colonizers viewed their colonies as well as the indigenous populations they destroyed. Restall continues saying misunderstandings and misrepresentations of something like Aztec civilization today can make it easier for us to misunderstand and misrepresent indigenous peoples of the Americas. The reason these versions of events have been perpetuated for so long is because there are many who benefit from their perpetuation internationally. Uh, the energy that Spain put towards the Aztecs and other indigenous populations in the 1500s is was led to the continuation of that and as they expanded north, as well as the ways indigenous populations were and are treated in the United States, Canada, across the globe. Um, the repercussions of these perceptions of the Aztecs and other native peoples in the Americas is still felt in the racism, colorism, and other forms of oppression carried out still today and have been carried out throughout history. So uh, all that to say, it's there's a lot to unpack with that. And I think I remember, I honestly like viscerally learning about uh, Hernan Cortez and it was not a full picture. And I think there's still a lot being unpacked for the full picture or the people who have known the full picture have not been listened to and are starting to be listened to. But the, the, there's a lot of misunderstandings and misconceptions surrounding one, that entire event, but also just like the Aztecs in general, as well as the other indigenous populations that existed around uh, Mexica uh, and the Aztec empire. So uh, one thing to just to kind of explain why I'm talking about this in the first place um, is how this kind of all connects to Atoll uh, and their character development. So like why were the Aztecs brought up in the character development of Atoll? Um, in certain dark things, Atoll is a uh, Talawupalchi species of vampires inspired by Aztec gods. I'm sorry, I butchered that horribly. Um, on Sylvia Marina Garcia's blog called Build a Vampire, they unpack where the character Adol came from and the origins of the lore. So they say, and this is a long quote, so just I figured it'd be better to just come directly from Sylvia. Um, so they say Adol, the protagonist of the novel, um, is Talawupalchi. Uh, a Tawabulpachi is a creature from central Mexico, which belongs to the rich tradition of witches in Latin America and the Caribbean. My great grandmother spoke of the witches menacing the countryside, casting spells on men and performing mayhem. Um, they are a type of witch, which is able to transform into an animal, often a turkey, and it drinks the blood of small children during the night. It can grow at nights. Um, my gran great grandmother spoke of, spoke of balls of fire in the trees, which cackled. Um, and they are born with this condition, which manifests when they become teenagers. Evil is therefore a genetic gift or ailment. Um, there are many and contradictory ways to deal with such creatures, some simple and others elaborate. You can sew little silver, silver medals with faces of saints to the clothes the child wears, tie a handkerchief, or repel the vampire witch with garlic or onions. But these are not the only solutions. There are probably two dozen ways to tackle them. Folklore is complicated. In moving this creature from a rural context to the modern urban city, I made changes to it. Adel is not a witch, and although she transforms into a bird-like creature, she does not haunt for babies. But she does need young blood and ends up picking, finding and picking a teenage garbage picker who can provide this. When working on my novel, the basic question was, what if vampires were real, not myths? So Adol emerged from the sort of realistic vampire. She can't cast spells, a little metal won't scare her, and she descends from the bloodsuckers who integrated well with the Aztec society. She is contrasted through the book and with other authentic vampires who have European origins and seem to be the basis for the vampire as found in pop culture like Dracula. 
Society in Certain Dark Things is inundated with portrayals of Euro vampires, but the Mesoamerican ones are less visible. This is a slight parable to the way Mexican society is inundated with Anglo culture, walk by a Mexican bookstore, look at the SFF section, and witness it's all books in translation. Of course, by positioning itself in an urban context, by offering a glossary in the back, and categorizing vampires, certain dark things break some of the complications of folklore. Oral tradition allows for knots and contradictions the printed page and the modern fantasy novel avoids. My great-grandmother's stories were not always the same in the telling. They did not all align neatly. My novel borrows liber liberally from Mexican folklore, from my thoughts on Aztec culture, from Mexico City life, noir films, and old horror movies. There are other versions of vampirism by Latin American writers. David Bullis wrote An Ancient Hunger, Silent Wings, which also stars um, the same kind of vampire. Incidentally, Bullis has a collection coming out in a few months, uh, The Chupacabra Vengeance, which contains this and other stories. What am I saying, question mark, that I offer one vision for Mexican vampires, but one alone, which should not be viewed as universal, nor the only one. Here below, I rep reproduce stories with happy endings and my short story collection, The Strange Way of Dying, which takes the vampire in Mexico in a different direction. Um, so there are obviously, as I was saying, there's a lot of misconceptions surrounding Aztecs. Uh, and specifically the importance of blood in their belief system. So what was portrayed by Spain as satanic was misunderstandings surrounding the Aztec rituals and belief systems um, and the mythology surrounding the origins of humanity and their relationships with the God tie back to blood. Um, the gods gave their blood to give humanity life and the, and the Aztec traditions giving blood back was a part of honoring life and these gods and was a way to continue life on this planet. Um, in my learning, I ended up reading an entire book about Quetzalcoatl, or the Plume Serpent, which was one of the most important gods in Mesoamerica, according to the internet. Um, take that with a grain of salt. I'm going to trust that Google kind of knows what they're talking about, but if I am wrong, I apologize. Um, but the Quetzalcoatl was a mix of bird and rattlesnake. Their name is a combination of the Nahuatl words, Quetzal, which is emerald plumed bird, and Coatl, which means serpent. Quetzalcoatl is the god of winds and rain and the creator of the world and humanity. Why am I teaching you about Quetzalcoatl? I'll tell you. Because uh, my theory is that some variety of adult and the way that they physically appear could somehow connect with Quetzalcoatl. And specifically, since Sylvia mentions that she does pull from Aztec lore, that uh, that could be possible. So in the World Histories Encyclopedia's overview of the Dawn Lord, um, which they were a Mesoamerican god who represented the menacing aspects of Venus, the morning star, and was one of the four gods which held up the sky. The people of ancient Americas believed his rays could damage people, crops, and water sources, but they played a key role in the Aztec creation myth as well as the 12th and and was one of the 12th of the 13 lords of the day in the Aztec calendar. Each aspect of Venus, morning and evening, was manifested in the form of two ancient Mesoamerican gods, the feathered serpent, Quetzalcoatl, and his canine companion, Oxalotl. Quetzalcoatl represented Venus in the morning star, and Oxalotl represented it as the evening star. Now, I'm not 100% sure because I couldn't find anything specifically stating this to be true, but I think... The version of Adel in Silvia Moreno-Garcia's book carries similarities to Quetzalcoatl in that her transformation in the book mimics that of a feathered serpent and that her dog, Kuali, could be similar to the canine companion, Axolotl. Um, the book I read on Scribd titled Quetzalcoatl, The History and the Legacy of the Feathered Serpent God in Mesoamerican Mythology by Charles River was pretty interesting. Um, I thought Quetzalcoatl was fascinating. Uh, their, the mythology as well as like the belief systems of the Aztecs was super interesting, and Quetzalcoatl was not unique to the Aztecs alone. That he was believed in uh, by many Mesoamerican uh, indigenous groups. So it seems that that was something that was prevalent in the area and is interesting. So uh, I I don't know if I'd go as far to be like I recommend this book because I don't I don't think I'm the authority to say which book knows what they're talking about and which books are great. Um, but I did find it interesting, and if you wanted to learn a little bit more about Quetzalcoatl, that is something you could check out. Um, 
But as I said, it kind of just gave me additional context to things I didn't know already because I didn't really have any basis for Aztec lore, mythology, belief systems, etc. Like I didn't get the opportunity to learn about that in school. So I had to seek that out as an adult and I found it really fascinating. So as always, you know, I kind of encourage you to learn about stuff yourself as well. Um, yeah, it's I, all of that is so interesting because it, like you said, it's not something that we learn about. It's not something mm-hmm. that like we've had the luxury of it being explained in school, mm-hmm. um, especially like specifically from a this lens. <laughs> like yeah. growing up in America, your school, like in uh, the U.S., your schooling has a very specific lens that you're going to learn from. Colonization is great. We love that. The world, everyone just opened their borders and we're like, hello, friend. Give me a <laughs> hug. Yeah. Here is the world now. We love it. It's great. Here's Christianity. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, You're everyone, welcome. everyone was just so happy to have that. You know, they were just like, wow, I never had that. This is the best now. Forget Here's everything some else before. Yeah, love that. It's the best. It's the best thing ever. That's how people feel. Uh, that's what America like, says. We're the best, <laughs> and so everyone should strive to be us. We're just going to erase and forget about all the really amazing, cool things that you were before, because mm-hmm. it was not us. So it's not good. It yeah, it was bad. Good. <laughs> Everyone's so thankful to not be themselves ever again. We just have new self now. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Um <laughs> Conformity. Yeah. And there, yeah. and I, you know, I'm so appreciative of this like robust history lesson that we get, or just like to see like that there is this, you know, other history um, that there's. And that I probably didn't even have the whole thing. Like there's, I mm-hmm. not, I am technically a historian. I did get a history degree, uh, but bachelor's. So like, uh, it's just, I'm not even like. Yeah. So that wasn't your fantasy, focus. So. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like, so, you know, like, let me tell you about Mexico forever. Like. Yeah. No, it was like capitalism exclusively <laughs> and how awful it is. Um, but yeah, so if anything, it's like, please learn about it too. Like do your mm-hmm. own research time, learn as much as you can, read books that make you realize other stuff exists for a minute because the amount of inundated everyone is with these stories that aren't this one, <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, the ones that for get sure. like the funding and the money and the attention generally aren't the ones that should be unfortunately so do learn stuff guys that's always the goal yeah like I hope that our show like Sylvia Moreno Garcia's books inspire you to do more right like you're like oh Mm -hmm. I got a taste of it now I want to learn about it and so you get a taste of it here and now you're going to go and start asking those like deep questions or, or just like questioning what you know and what you've learned and maybe the mm-hmm. limited lens in which you've learned and understood uh questioning you know even just certain media around uh that content as well like start asking those questions <laughs> use your middle, yeah. middle literacy glasses like we always do yeah. who's making it and why you know yeah what's, what's, what's their this motivation do? why why did they get all the the, the time on the screen why, yeah. why? ask why yeah um, yeah i think so, it would be good do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 go listen um also and uh we will be going on break so we won't have any other episodes here in september but um we'll be back in october as you know rejuvenated as we can be and we'll be talking about gothic horror in different ways under these kind mm-hmm. of specific sub topics um which hopefully will work out <laughs> we'll see how it goes yeah. Um, I think Gothic literature will be great, but we'll also be revisiting Sylvia Moreno Garcia in that series. So if you liked her, if you liked it, definitely take a listen to that. Look forward to it. And uh, always remember to like and subscribe, the bell so you get notifications because we'll be on like snooze for a month and then we'll come back and you'll be like, oh, right, my favorite show ever. <laughs> I wonder if anyone does feel that way. That'd be cool. Also like scary, but cool. If you feel that way, like, like drop you a like comment. us. <laughs> drop a comment if you like us <laughs> yeah, so you let us know. yeah what is your favorite sylvia moreno garcia and then what is also your favorite vampire like what version of vampire stories do you really like that's really cool mm-hmm. 
um, we'll be talking about a vampire in our gothic literature section. So uh, if that's your favorite, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. But it might be your favorite vampire. I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, it'll be fun. I'm excited. And we'll be rejuvenated over short break. Mm. We'll sleep. We'll do big sleep and then come back like mm, hype as awake. Yeah, like big <laughs> awake. Like we're gonna be like, what? You missed us and we are new now. We are new yeah. year, new us, except it's only October. <laughs> There's much so much year time. left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, absolutely. Well, don't get married. They'll eat your kids. Yeah. Literally, because they're vampires. Or they'll like or they wipe out your whole family because you're a part of the drug your drug lord family. That would suck. Yeah. (laughs) Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do it. Um, Yeah. (laughs) yeah. Uh, instead, read this book, read books, and read up on Mexican history, and we will see you in October. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Oh, yeah. Bye.